Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Christ Christoph Corell. Um, he's from, visiting us from uh, Berlin, I think. Um, so uh, his, he's going to be talking to us about longevity in people with severe mental illness. So thanks very much. Great. Thanks very much for the introduction and also the invitation. Thank you all for being here, trying to live longer. Obviously, uh, the bad news is the older you get, the closer you get to death, no matter what. The question is, how do you get there well? And how do you, as we heard, compress the gap between lifespan and health span? And I'll be talking, we are coming from the brain to the brain to the brain. This is the third talk. Um, I'll be talking, thank you, um, from the end of very disadvantaged people, and that is people who have mental illness. I'm both an adult psychiatrist as well as child and adolescent psychiatrist, simply because when I entered adult psychiatry, I very quickly noticed intervening then when the illness hits is already too late. We need to move earlier. And one of the questions was for Harold Pincus earlier, well, what about depression like 150 years ago? I mean, we know from the Greeks, that's your question exactly, that mental illness was described even 2,500 years ago. And we also know that trauma is one of the biggest risk factors for gene expression and for maladaptive behaviors that lead to more mental illness, both in yourself and in the people around you and in the next generation. And arguably, some of the most traumatic experiences have been somewhat reduced in more recent times, at least in some of the developed world. So in that sense, I would suppose that depression was even worse in like 150 or 500 years ago times because there was malnutrition, there was emaciation, there was also a lot of trauma ongoing and not much care, both psychological and medical. But again, as Harold Pinker said, we don't know all of the roots into mental illness, but they are clearly biopsychosocial. And we're trying to improve this, but there's also a genetic underpinning. So when talking about this, I have some disclosures, but this is not about medications. Um, we did a meta-analysis of 193 studies looking at the incidence ages of certain mental disorders. And maybe you're not aware of that, but by the age of 14, a third of all mental disorders have declared themselves. By the age of 18, half of all mental disorders have already started, being diagnosed, by the way. And by the age of 25, two-thirds are there. So mental illness is an early lifespan occurrence. That's a huge problem because that's a sandwich effect that we will see in a minute. So, oops, that's the wrong direction. So what we can see here with, in terms of years lived with disability, in red you see mental and behavioral disorders, they're particularly large in the early lifespan when people have to undergo developmental milestones, when they have to develop their own self, relate to others, and basically develop. And here we already have a lot of disability. A lot of these disorders that I showed on the prior slide, oops, that's here, um, start early and interfere with this normal biopsychosocial development, learning, developing your own sense of self, but also social interactions. And we've heard it about, again, the pandemic, that being with other people is so important for the young people. And when you have a mental illness that interferes with that, that has multiple ripple down and domino effects. So we have on the one side, years lived with disability that start early, and then obviously as you age, there's more musculoskeletal disorders and also um, problems with the heart and so forth. But we also have, I have to learn this, an increase in terms of disability-adjusted life years due to cardiovascular and circulatory diseases. And those are particularly high in patients with severe mental illness because depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, 
have an average metabolic syndrome rate of about a third. One out of three people with mental illness, severe mental illness, has, men has a metabolic syndrome. And if you then go from normal weight to overweight to obese, we've looked at that, you're going from basically a third to a half to three quarters of people who have metabolic syndrome. So if you're obese and have a mental disorder, 75% me um, metabolic syndrome. So you're dying earlier 20 years because of the cardiovascular disease, but you also have morbidity before that. And in the earlier age, you already have the mental disorder. So we need to understand that, and we need to also prevent as much as possible that this is occurring. So this is prevention psychiatry. Um, we need to go there. It's not just reactive medicine, as we've already heard. That's not where we want to be treating something that has already happened. And we just had a professor from China. You know that the Chinese basically fired the doctor when the emperor got sick. It's about keeping someone from getting sick. And I mean, fortunately, we as doctors are not fired for sickness of our patients. Otherwise, we would all be out of business. But there are different ways of preventing, and uh, we put some here on this blueprint for improving mental health of young people, um, published two years ago, there's obviously universal prevention, all the good stuff that we should all do, but that also policies should en uh, enrich and help us doing, and that is the healthy lifestyle, it's um, obviously smoking uh, cessation and so forth, but also urban spaces should be green. We know that if they're not and if there's some pollution, both noise and also other chemicals that you are more likely to be physically ill, but also mentally ill. So there is a higher rate of schizophrenia in urban centers, even if you control for, for genetic background. Then there is a selective uh, in, uh, prevention, which basically means you have risk factors you identify. And um, that is mostly genetics. Uh, we're not yet much better in terms of early biomarkers because we don't even understand how these disorders, for God's sake, happen. We don't know the pathophysiology, so getting biomarkers for that is even harder. We don't have the cell of a tumor that has been deranged. The brain is a wonderful place and it's hugely complex. And it's basically different from neurological disorders where you have a lesion that is a problem. We have neural networks that are the problem and that makes it very complex. So that's selective uh, indication when you have really markers that are there before an illness expression. And then there's indicated prevention, and that means you have an early emergence of symptoms and signs of an illness. So the forerunner of that is the prodromal research in schizophrenia, where attenuated positive symptoms, quasi-psychosis without being fully psychotic, give you an indication that this could be someone who is on the route to develop psychosis. Problem is that we first had 50% risk then 30% risk, and now that we do lots of outreach and screen everybody, it's only 15% of people who actually then convert to psychosis, which is very close to the 10% genetic risk. So we need to do better in combining clinical markers and biomarkers as much as possible, but also preventing the illness from um, um, coming out in the first place. And then there's obviously tertiary uh, prevention, which is once the illness has happened, we want to reduce relapses. Now, why do people with mental illness die 15 to 20 years earlier? Well, you see the burden of disease attributable to 20 leading risk factors leads you the path. Almost all of those, and I put here the most relevant ones with a red box around it, are more prevalent in people with severe mental illness. High blood, pr blood pressure, smoking, alcohol use, poor diet, be it low in fruit, high body mass index, which then comes with inflammation and increased oxidative stress, high plasma fasting glucose, physical inactivity, um, low uh, diet in nuts and seeds, high cholesterol, low grains, low vegetables, low seafood, and drug use. So we need to obviously target all of those, but it is also an economic component because people with mental illness often don't have the resources and a lot of this good stuff is more expensive. 
And then motivating ourselves to be physically active is already one problem. But if you have depression, negative symptoms, and also feel socially inept or already overweight, it reduces your ability to have agency, sense of agency, and do the right thing. Now, once an illness happens, can we in mental health with our ghastly medications prevent a relapse? Well, our medications often have very bad press. Let's talk about antipsychotics. They can make people fat because you have weight gain. They can give you diabetes. They can give you hypertension, dyslipidemia, prolactin elevation, which we've and others have shown to be related to breast cancer potentially. So really bad stuff. Should we even use them? Isn't it bad to treat your patients with that? They don't like this stuff. They want to stop it all along. Well, let's look at the numbers. Whenever we interpret meta-analyses, we have to look at both categorical outcomes and continuous outcomes. And a categorical outcome is yay or nay, relapse or not, response or not. And then you compare different percentages. And you know that the number needed to treat is the delta between two treatments. You calculate in your mind the number needed to treat every time you go shopping. You ask yourself, OK, there's like a cereal box I get one um, free, free for, for every third one. What's basically my number needed to treat? So if after every third one I have one extra, that's uh, 25%. So number needed to treat of four. After each fourth one, I get one for free. And that's the same here. So we can have a number needed to treat if it's 20% versus 53% is the response. Difference is 33%. So the NNT is three. Our NNTs are generally in single digit to be clinically relevant. And you can see here an acute response when people come and are very sick and get an antipsychotic, our NNT is six. Not bad, but when you then take people who have responded, and that's what we do in medicine for maintenance, we take responders, we enrich them, and then treat them further. The NNT doubles in terms of efficacy, it goes from six to three. So after each third person, you have one relapse prevention. And the SMD the, um, is a measure like Cohen's D, it's an effect size. Um, 0.2 is a fifth of the standard deviation is small, 0.5 is medium, 0.8 is large. We have very few medicines that, in, in all of medicine, that have a 0.8 and larger effect size. So in Responders, you have about a 0.4 effect size, but that doubles to 0.9 when you continue the treatment. So although the press says, oh, don't treat people with antipsychotics, it's really bad, we are doing pretty well. Now let's compare that to treatments that some of you might already be on it, and when you expand it to your family, many will be on this. So we have statins, ACE inhibitors, metformin, aspirin, all the great stuff, canonical treatments to prolong our life. Well, what's their number needed to treat to prevent one cardiovascular event? It's 10 to 20 fold higher. And look at the bismal effect sizes, they are less than 0.2. We still do this. We don't want to have a heart attack, of course, but for mental illness, we have powerful treatments. It's not that strong for antidepressants because we also have spontaneous recovery, lots of placebo effect, but it's not that different. And for antimania treatments, it's very similar. So our treatments do work, but do they also kill? We'll get there. I will learn that at the end. So the effectiveness pyramid tells us that medication is one thing, but we need to flank that obviously with psychoeducation and psychotherapy because we're not just biological animals, we're also psychosocial animals. And whenever a medication gets approved, we look at efficacy, but that's just the spearhead. We need tolerability and we need adherence. People and adherence is even not the best term. Compliance is bad. It's like, oh, I tell you what to do. Adherence is you know that's better for you to do that. I think medication interest is the right thing. I have an interest taking this. And obviously drug users have a lot of interest taking something and they're doing it even to their detriment. We want medications that make us interested. And if you have hypertension or diabetes, you're generally not interested in your drugs. You're just doing it, you don't even see what's going on, your blood pressure, your 
your glucose levels. It's, it's not palpable. That's why even in chronic medical disorders, non-adherence is rampant because it doesn't make us feel good. What is the medication that has the most adherence? Hmm? <laughs> not really. I mean, it might, might be an interesting thought, yeah? They're not bad because you see directly that you lose weight. It's also not anti-HIV drugs. It's not parents giving uh, cytostatics to their kids with cancer. It is painkillers. Why? Because the moment you don't take it, you get slapped and you feel bad. And the moment you take it, you feel better. It's so instantaneous. Many of the other things you have to think, oh, I should take it, have I, have I taken it? Maybe not. And I have all these side effects. So we want medications that make you feel good. And that's, I think, we need to develop more. Even for healthy lifespan, if you don't feel it, that you're healthier, it will be hard to actually get it into the system. Our side effects that we produce with any medication, here I'm taking again an example of antipsychotics, don't only have nuisance side effects, they actually impair functioning. Here are people with schizophrenia, more than 400 of them, who were asked on a visual analog scale between 0 and 100, how much do these side effects, activating, sedating, weight gain, sexual side effects, how much do they interfere with your functioning, not just your well-being? And they say between high 50s to high 60s. That's a reason why it's often stopped. And again, we need to take that seriously. And weight gain, as you know, is not good. That's why GLP-1 agonists uh, was um, certainly um, a weapon uh, that you can bring forward because many people want to lose weight and stay thin. Well, the brain is connected to the body through the neck. Again, uh, another uh, truism. And that shows here also people who are in the first episode of schizophrenia and gain weight and have one BMI point increase by one year, they age one month per year. And many patients basically gain five or six BMI points. And that means half a year per year, your, your brain gets older. That's not good. And we know even from the general population, people with diabetes, hypertension, obesity, metabolic syndrome, have worse cognition. And here we showed the same thing in people with schizophrenia. People with schizophrenia who already are one and a half to two standard deviation below the norm, the population norm, in terms of cognition, have even worse cognition when they, in addition to that, have metabolic syndrome, hypertension, diabetes. So another reason why we need to try to bring healthy lifestyle and an increase in health span to people with mental illness. People with schizophrenia, this is a meta-analysis we published um, last year, die threefold earlier than the general population. That increases to sevenfold more in people with early phase schizophrenia because those that have good cognition and insight get depressed that they have the illness, and then they commit suicide. So suicide rates are enormously high, and especially in the first five years of illness, when we need to pay attention to the body and the mind and also the reaction to the illness. They need to adjust their goals and also their expectations. But then the question is, now, if people die of diabetes and cardiovascular illness, wouldn't then our medications also push them into an earlier death. And I told you, oh, we can prevent relapse. What does that help us if they die earlier? But in that same meta-analysis, we found actually people who are on the medications live longer than people who are not on the medication. And why is that? Even though they're heavier, they have more diabetes and hypertension. Well, they're not as stressed by the psychosis, so cortisol levels are not as high. They also have better healthy lifestyle. And we looked at that in Finland. They take not only their antipsychotic, they also take other secondary preventive measures. In this case, statins, antidiabetics, antihypertensives, and beta blockers. So by improving the mental health, you're also improving the physical health because they're at least going to doctors and they're doing, um, also able to do better lifestyle behaviors. So, what we then put together, 
again, not another blueprint, we want to add years to life by protecting both the physical and the mental health of our patients. And there are issues and actions. There are elevated rates of smoking and other poor healthy lifestyle behaviors. We need to educate and give um, the possibility and potential for people to behave better, incentivize them, um, maybe even pay them for good behavior. That has, ha has gotten bad press but actually paying people for taking long-acting injectable medications where they have a harder time to be non-adherent, they have better outcomes. Paying us in, in our health system to uh, lose weight or uh, um, stop smoking, again, you have a cut in your, in your health uh, expenditure. So I think rewarding us for good behavior and doing that also with people with mental illness shouldn't be seen as unethical. We have to obviously frame that in the right way and have the right firewalls and the right agencies. Suboptimal prescribing, and um, Harold Pinkus talked about it, that um, the implementation of our knowledge is so poor People with mental illness have a very high risk of cardiovascular illness. They are monitored not more than people who have just asthma, although they have both the mental illness and they have antipsychotics on board. So it's really very poor managing and monitoring, especially in the United States where you don't have as much time. You mentioned value-based payment, pay for performance. I think we need to do much more in order to incentivize good behavior also on the clinician side. Otherwise, um, we, we lose out on that one. There's inadequate health promotion and uh, inadequate um, integration. We've heard about fragmentation of care, of both physical and mental health care. And that can be remedied, but we as a society need to do that, both for people without and for with mental illness. And in the statement that Harold Pincus showed that including behavioral health well, we need to spell it out apparently because it's often excluded. Um, we need to integrate mental health and physical health as much as we can so that we look at the patient again in totality. And it's not just recovery and functionality, it's really life engagement, a sense of agency and identifying their goals and trying to have smart goals, specific, measurable, actionable, relevant and time bound. And we should do that with people without and with mental illness. And one out of four people will have mental illness in their life. So this is a very big part of our society. And especially as people age more, it will be maybe closer to 40 or 50%. So let me finish with to keep the body in good health as a duty. Otherwise, we shall not be able to keep our minds strong and clear. And that even Buddha knew. Thank you very much. I don't know whether we have time for some questions. Yes, we have. Okay, great. Harold? Terrific presentation, Christoph. Thanks. So it seems to me that a lot of the sort of underlying issue is especially with people with uh, uh, serious mental illnesses, but really even beyond that, um, is the fact that we let people fall through the cracks. Um, and a number of years ago, we did a study looking at um, outpatient mental health care, and for an episode of mental health care as an outpatient, the modal number of visits for an episode was, guess? 0 0.5. It was one. One. <laughs> one. <laughs> oh, yeah, and you had them in the clinic, so that's why. This, yeah. yeah, but this is, this is nationally. Yeah. Um, the modal number of visits was one. The median number was four. Um, obviously, the mean was higher because some people go five times a week. Yeah. Um, but, but that's really the problem, is that, there's, that we somehow aren't able to engage people um, on the, you know, because these are not short-term conditions, and we're not able to engage people. Do you have some thoughts about what strategies might be undertaken to better engage people? Yeah, so I think you're saying falling between the cracks. Unfortunately, in, within the system, we're also creating the cracks in order to save money. Yeah? You had it also on your slide, um, 
preferred list, fail first, second opinion. I mean, I remember when I was a resident that people, uh, I had to um, argue with someone in the, on the insurance side, and they said, well, do something. You have to increase the dose, otherwise you have to discharge the patient. Why? I mean, they just did it three days ago. Your competitors change every other day. And I said, what, what do I do if the patient is discharged and kills themselves? Well, you discharge them. I didn't. Yeah, so that's, that's on the system side. But I think, how do we engage people better? They need to see value. Like medication interests, it should be also mental health interest. And our systems are not always as conducive. Obviously, some patients, we also need to use force, um, particularly when they're psychotic, but even people with depression. I think it has to do, on a, on a macro level, again, with decreasing stigma, making sure that people understand health is also mental. There's no health without mental health. And I think there the pandemic has helped us a little bit, that it's okay to talk about being anxious and depressed. It's not just a weird subgroup. It's, it's all of us because pressure creates problems. But we need to incentivize people. We need to give them good experiences. And um, for that, we need resources and the currency of love, time. We don't have enough time. We don't invest the time and obviously all the money. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. <laughs> thanks.